Okay, so our next uh, session is Deep Hyper on steroids. So, you know, we will we'll talk about how to run Deep Hyper on some of the world's fastest supercomputers. Um, and uh, so that's that's the sort of um, the the capability that we have, you know, we can run it on laptop and, and with the minimal modification, we can then port um, the, the hyperparameter search and deep hyper, uh, uh, the neural architecture search or, or ensembles, uncertainty quantification, whatever we have, right? So on, on large missions, in fact, uh, the, the, the advantage of deep hyper is much, much more profound uh, when we run that on um, on these big machines and and even it's a you know reasonably sized cluster and so on and so forth okay so um, this session we'll be talking about how to run deep hyper at uh, on, on three different uh, platforms and um, um, yeah so uh, that will not be a hands on um, uh, but we have the scripts ready to go on the on the on the GitHub so. We will be covering that and show like how to use that. So essentially you can just download the script and run that on, on these machines and you will have the SSD um, hyperparameter search running at scale. So, um, uh, okay, so first um, uh, we'll, we'll focus on uh, NERSC. Um, uh, Nesser, um, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, thanks Prasanna. Uh... So like Prasanna was saying, so uh, we've seen a few uh, notebook hands-on examples, uh, but uh, the, the place where Deep Hyper really has an edge on our other op hyper-optimization searches is, is working at scale. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really nice to highlight these things. And uh, like, again, like Prasanna mentioned, we don't really have hands-on uh, sessions for this. And you're showing three different um, supercomputing facilities and how to use on them. So we're gonna go a little fast, but uh, you know, feel free to check the all the codes that are on GitHub already, and um, there's, there's a README files for each of them as well. All right. So starting with the NERSC Perlmutter. Um, so this is a new uh, flagship computer from NERSC. So NERSC, the model is quite different from the National Labs uh, computational facilities in the sense that it's um, so there are a lot more users. It's essentially like supercomputing for the masses, um, and so there's so a lot of university users use it. So, so Perlmutter is the latest one. So it's a heterogeneous CPU and GPU system. And in the first phase right now, there's there's uh, 1500 nodes with four A100 GPUs each. So they've achieved up to like 70 petaflops, uh, which place them at number five on the top 500 list. Uh, so this is this is kind of a successor of a Cori system, which has a many cores. So this is their first GPU system. Um, so we've we've been running a lot of tests and we've been in touch with the NOS folks regarding uh, running things on uh, Perlmutter. And uh, just to give an overview of the hardware specification, uh, so like I said, it has uh, six thousand GPUs. So so these are fifteen hundred uh, nodes with four A one hundred GPUs each. And the memory on them on, uh, is a, is about forty GBs each for each GPU, and half precision of three hundred twelve uh, teraflops is the peak performance, and and double precision is about nineteen point five teraflops. So it's it's pretty fast systems, and these GPUs are connected by uh, these NV links, and they're bonded, uh, they're linked within each other, and it's also connected to a a, a CPU using PCI Express. So it supports all the tensor cores uh, and multi-instance GPUs as well, but although we have not used the multi-instance GPUs, um, at least I have not personally. Um, so uh, for, for this example and all the other uh, supercomputing examples, uh, we're going to use the same code that was shown in the beginning. So that's a hyperparameter search for the sea surface temperature. And you saw the notebook before, and uh, what changes is that we, we basically rewrote that code in a, like a native Python script with, with some changes that, that adds functionalities or convenience. Um, and for specifically for Perlmutter, um, the login instructions and the installation instructions are given in the readme file. Uh, so I would recommend you can go through the you know, GitHub page um, and, and check out all the, all the instructions there. Um, so what 
one would do if they were to try out these codes is first go to the directory and uh, copy uh, all this all the submission scripts uh, evaluation scripts and there are a couple of other python codes with a lot of useful uh, functions in them so once you have everything uh, and you have the data also uh, then you can you can get started with running this on your own uh, so a few things that uh, is unique to Perlmutter is uh, they have this really nice MPI system, uh, which is a, which is CUDA aware. Um, so it allows the programmers uh, to have a GPU pointed to multiple MPI function calls. And you don't have to do a lot of uh, manual memory copies within CUDA. Um, so uh, so it, it makes uh, our job a lot easier when you when you write things write, write codes with uh, on Perlmutter with MPI and CUDA combined. Uh, what changes is when you insta install MPI 4 Pi, uh, you have to uh, make the installation kind of CUDA aware, and uh, the the code the the installation script that you see, which is also on GitHub, uh, it has this uh, special arguments that are added. Um, where, where you link the MPI CC and then uh, then install the MPI for Pi. Uh, it also has a, a something called a CUDA unified memory, uh, which basically means that uh, some of the memory, if there's a common address space between the CPUs and GPUs, and it kind of manages this heterogeneous architecture really well. And this is done automatically, so there's no fresh installation or anything. It just adds to the performance. Um, and so getting back to the how we change the original codes that were run on your laptops or wherever you run it, how do you change that to something on Perlmutter? Is uh, one thing that changes is what kind of evaluators do you want to use? So parallelly, uh, there are uh, a few different evaluators, so Ray and MPI being uh, really convenient. Um, and within that, MPI, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, is it turns out to be the really useful one. And it uses MPI 4Py in the back end. And the, the good thing is that you, you do all the imports once and you don't have to do it at each evaluation. So this works with all the workers at, at, at the same time. Um, and uh, one small difference between the notebook codes and this one is within the evaluator. So that's in the code called evaluator.mpi in the GitHub. Um, you, you specify uh, a separate method called MPI comp. And also when you, then this can be submitted through slur submission and, and you use the usual S run or MPI run to, to execute the search. I think somebody asked earlier, like whether you can use slurp or something. So this is how you do it. I uh, think, I, I suppose the question earlier was whether you, you can kind of um, submit new jobs for every worker, but that's not how it's done, uh, at least in this implementation, it's all, you, you allocate uh, n number of nodes and ranks per nodes, and like you can run an individual worker per GPU. So like you can go up to four workers on single node on Perlmutter, and the submission script is right there. Uh, one thing that changes is when you use LSTM with CUDA, uh, you can actually exploit what's called the uh, CUDNN module. Uh, so it's CUDA's deep learning module that can be that can speed up a lot of implementations. Uh, however, with the LSTM layer, a lot of functionalities are not supported. And uh, so, if you if you were to use this, uh, it it really maximizes the performance, and you can avoid a lot of out of memory errors. But the deep hyper search space will have to be narrower. So that means. Uh, in the LSTM layer, so this is similar to the parts that were shown in the uh, Jupyter notebooks as well. Uh, here we have reduced space by two, so this activation is is um, in the LSTM layer is set to ten uh, hyperbolic ten. The recurrent activation is sigmoid, and it's always the same. So if you do this, and there are a couple of others other requirements and you can check that out in the TensorFlow. Only if all these requirements are set, you can use the uh, CUDNN module. And if you don't, it just goes to the pure Python implementation and that'll be slower. 
so in this example that is uploaded on the GitHub, uh, we have actually reduced the uh, search space. Um, and finally, the, the parallelization scheme. So uh, Prasanna and Roman uh, had mentioned these two centralized and decentralized way of uh, parallelizing. Um, either of that can be used in the example that is uh, shown. We have used the, the centralized approach. So that is single manager, multiple worker approach. Um, and nothing really changes here. So you still import the CBO uh, module within the Piper search HPS. And, and you can run, so so not a lot of things change when you do parallel uh, searches. Uh, one thing that uh, Roman and others have added recently is really nice uh, profiling plots. And, and you can understand a lot of what is going on uh, with, with the managers and the workers when you use these plots. So the, the plot on the right basically shows uh, the profiling within Perlmutter for, for, for like a sample problem. And uh, the top panel here shows the number of jobs submitted. So these are jobs that are being executed or just waiting for execution. Uh, so it kind of shows how the evalu how the manager is doing its job, so how it's uh, firing off new uh, jobs. And the bottom panel is actually showing how the resource, like how the number of GPUs are being used. So this is the true usage of the allocations. And this shows the, the, the number of simultaneous jobs being executed. And uh, yeah, so, so you can actually see that it's doing a pretty good job of using up a lot of all the allocated GPUs. Uh, it, it starts doing that very quickly. And once the search is kind of converged, you see that it's reduced or, or you've reached your maximum evaluations. Um, so, so that's the presentation. So if you have any questions, let me know. And like I said, so please try these examples if you have access to NERSC. And um, yeah, good thing is it, it's very easy to get access to NERSC, NERSC systems. Okay. Thanks, Nasser. Are there other questions on running DPiper NERSC? So in the interest of time, we can move to the next uh, speaker. Um, again, thank you, Nasser. Thanks for joining from, from India. I, I'm pretty sure it's very, very late for you. Hope you get That's a good sleep good. with uh, also your jet lag. So yeah. thank you so Thanks. much for joining. Thank you. Sam? Should I go, go okay. on my screen? Yeah, please do. All right. Um, all right, hope we can see it now. Yeah, perfect. All right. Yeah, so um, yeah, so today I'll be talking a bit about um, running DeepHyper at scale on the GPU. So again, a lot of the actual material in here is you know just borrowed from earlier sections in the workshop and the tutorials. Um, but the main purpose is just to you know see how get familiar with running on data GPU and learn how to take advantage of um, distributed evaluations and running efficiently. So um, kind of just a brief overview of some of, of what the capabilities are. So per node, um, each you know on data GPU each each node consists of eight NVIDIA A100 GPUs. Um, the bulk of the nodes have 320 gigs of um, GPU memory. Um, again, if, for people who are familiar with the system, this is all part of view, but just some you know facts on the system there. Hopefully, everybody should have at least um, had some experience getting on the system. So if anybody is still having trouble with their accounts or getting access, then make sure to let us know and we can get that worked out. Um, then, so if, you know, assuming no problems, you should be able to log in to Theta just from your local machine through using SSH, using your username and connecting to Theta ANL.gov. From Theta login node, you can submit a job directly to Theta GPU using the QSub GPU command. Um, so Theta GPU uses the Cobalt scheduler. So it's a bit, maybe a bit different than some of the other schedulers, but they all, perform the same 
same purpose. And if you have any uh, questions or things about that, feel free to let us know and we will um, provide answers or point you in the right direction if you can. Um, one thing to be sure of when doing these is to make sure that the script that you're that you're working on that you're submitting is executable. So if you're going to do an issue, um, you can you know make it change the um, yeah change it and make it make it executable. So that shouldn't be a problem. The newest condo module on Data GPU actually already comes pre-installed with the Piper. So the GitHub repository has a shell script that gives instructions on how to install it, which is good to know, good for reference, but it comes pre-installed. Um, to make sure you can run the, you know, these kind of, kind of series of tests, you know, load the mod, load the condo module by just calling module load. And then activating the base conda environment should put you into, you know, this mini conda three environment, the base environment. And you can check and make sure you're executing the correct Python, making sure by running which Python. Um, in the interest of time, I probably won't go through this in too much detail since it's been covered previously and it's already pre-installed. But if you want to, the instructions for actually installing it, um, installing MPI for Pi and getting making sure that you know the Piper and everything that you need is installed. There are instructions here and on the GitHub repo as well. Um, again, we're not going to go through the you know, details of the hyperparameter search since that you guys have seen all of that already. And again, as they as we saw in the previous talk, um, the kind of bulk difference here being that the commands which are ran in, you know interactively in a Jupyter notebook are now aggregated and put into a unified search.py script, which is responsible for executing the hyperparameter search and running the MPI based evaluator. Um, you, there, there are a couple of utility functions in this utils.py file. So you, if you were to run, try to run this um, you know, on your own model or in your own workspace, make sure that you have the necessary files because otherwise it's, make sure you copy it over so that you can find all the functions it needs to. Um, the other, one of the other main differences for running on, you know, in a distributed environment on you know, one of these various supercomputers that you need to make sure that the communication is initialized correctly and that um, you prevent race conditions. So make, you need to make sure that you don't have multiple workers trying to you know, write to a, the same file or you know, read write from, to the same file at the same time, which can cause problems. And so the main, Parts of this um, really come in this initial or MPI initialization. So you can set it up and it th initialize the thread and then get this rank, which refers to your global rank. And so this number will, rank, will run from zero to the number of um, separate ranks that you request from your Cobalt job size. And then on each one of these ranks, it's important, kind of important to keep in mind that on each one of these ranks, you can you have the possibility of having multiple separate GPUs. And so you need to make a distinction between your global rank, which indexes the rank um, from you know zero to the cobalt job size, and then the actual GPU process index that's on that rank. Um, so GPUs are initialized in or initialized in TensorFlow using this kind of this little loop here. So you can list the physical devices. And you know, then and you know, instantiate and initialize each one of them depending on the local index of your GPU. And once all of your GPUs have been initialized, you then need to be sure that you're only loading data from one of the ranks, which um, doesn't matter which, but as long as you're consistent and usually, you know, it's almost always done from rank zero. So it's just one thing to be you know aware of or cognizant of when you're doing this. Um the the in the github repo and also seen here on the left is an example script that will actually run the job search for you so the, this preamble just specifies things about the cobalt job so which queue you want to submit to the number of ranks that you want to use the time that you want your job to run for the project allocation that you're going to charge this run against 
um, flags for mounting certain file systems and then the output of the job file name. Um, once you've done that, you need to set up your environment to make sure that you have dpiper you know, loaded into your current environment. And then with that, you can then just run, um, you know, MPI run and distribute across all of your ranks this, this search problem. Um, here, this is kind of an extra slide, but it goes over how to use Jupyter on Theta GPU. So for those who are interested, you can kind of use port, you know, S, a combination of port forwarding through with SSH to get it set up. So I'll just leave that for reference if people want to look at it later. Um, and now I will, so I ran this interactively a little while ago, so you guys can all see kind of the results. Um, so after you were to run this um, MPI run on this, search, this you know, distributed search problem, you will get some series of results, which get put into a directory. And you can then kind of look at um, results of the search, which are output to the CSV file, and I'll give you information about, um, you know, each of the individual runs and the different configurations specified. Um, and as well, I think it also spits out um, this YAML file that has information about, you know, some of the metadata about the context of the execution and things like that. Um, so I know that was probably pretty quick, but I hope the bulk of the information was clear. And again, it's all, all of this is available on the GitHub repo and the scripts directory and under ALCF data GPU. Um, yeah, and so I guess that about covers it. If anybody has any questions or anything, feel free. To chime in, but again, there's hopefully, and there, again, there's a lot of documentation for just running effectively on Theta GPU, um, you know, at on alcf.anl.gov. There's a lot, you know, a bunch of documentation pages and things for people who are interested. And we are all here to to help out with any problems that you might run into or anything. So just feel free to let us know. But, that is great. Thank, thanks, Sam. Um, yep, no problem. So with that, I guess I will pass it off to Kyle. Fantastic. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay, thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks to Persona Ramon and all the other D-Piper team members for organizing this workshop. It's been great. I'm Happy to be able to share some of my recent experience running D Piper at scale on Summit. You know, it's going to be a lot of overlap with the previous two talks, but Summit itself has a few quirks that I kind of suffered through the last month or so that I'm happy to share my lessons learned with you. And hopefully you can save some time if you have an allocation on this machine. So for those who are unfamiliar with Summit, it was number one in the world for about two years. Now it's been kind of replaced by uh, Frontier, and hopefully we'll get access to that soon and we'll be able to add it to the repository and instructions on how to build dPiper there. It's an IBM AC922 machine, which is a machine that they marketed and sold to other institutions. I know they have kind of mini summits at Princeton, for example. So some of the instructions that you'll have here and that you can find in the GitHub you'll be able to reuse, hopefully, and modify for your purposes if you have access to those machines. It has nearly 5,000 nodes, each with six V100s, so roughly 30,000 GPUs, and it only takes 13 megawatts of power, which is about half of what we expect the exascale machines to uh, use, or are about to use. Um, and it was actually quite an improvement over Titan, where he'd only used a bit more power, but he was about 10x the computational power. Um, there's quite a bit of injection bandwidth, 200 gigabits per second per node, and each of the V100s per node are linked with NVLink 2.0 between each other and to their host CPU, as you'll see on the next slide. And the big struggles that people who are new to this machine might have are often attributed to the IBM specific parts of the machine. In fact, the MPI is its own flavor called Spectrum MPI. They have their own 
scheduler that's not Slurm, it's not Cobalt, it's called uh, LSF, and the CPUs themselves actually are kind of IBM homebrewed. So here's what a single node looks like. It's kind of a traditional at, at first glance uh, CPU GPU node where you have a dual socket CPU and six uh, NVIDIA GPUs. This is of course the older architecture because this machine came out in 2018. So it's you know not as good as the A100s on both the previous machines and the last two talks. Uh, in fact, these V100s are the smaller memory footprint versions. There is a 32 gigabyte version of the V100, but they're not on this machine. And they're currently running a driver with CUDA 11.0. It used to be much older, and I think this is probably going to be the last uh, driver update they're going to get until the machine's end of life. As you can see, as I mentioned, they're all linked together with these pretty fast NVLinks, but it's a generation old at this point of NVLink. And the CPUs, and this is where all the fun is, is they're actually a RISC architecture. So it's not x86 CISC architecture. There's 42 uh, physical cores, each capable of four-way simultaneous multi-threading. Uh, and they have a fast clock, but being RISC, they're actually not that powerful. Um, in fact, if you do comparisons with even Skylake CPUs from around the same time, or even earlier, um, I find they don't actually compare very favorably, but they do save a lot on power, and that's how you get to that 13 megawatt overall machine target. And it's also worth mentioning that each node has an attached SSD, which is pretty common these days for burst buffer storage. It can be really good for your deep hyper application if you need to stream input data as you're evaluating different neural networks. So before we get back to the Power9 quirks, which will be the majority of this talk, um, I'll just give an overview of the scheduler differences. At this point, as we've seen, the schedulers are all more or less the same thing, but you have to kind of do a Rosetta Stone of translating between the different commands and flags. So there's three different types of nodes on the machine. Login nodes, which you're all familiar with, I hope. Launch nodes and compute nodes. And what's nice about these is it's a nearly homogeneous architecture that even the login nodes and the launch nodes have V100s attached to them and the same type of Power9 CPU, although they're slightly weaker, and there's only four V100s on the login and launch nodes. So that makes it really easy for building and compiling, unlike on Theta GPU, <coughs> where you have to, where you're suggested that you actually build Deep Hyper and whatever CUDA libraries you want on a actual compute node, you can do this all on the login node and you don't have to grab an allocation. So to get to the login, here's the uh, A login. There's several of them. Here's the uh, URL you can use to SSH. Once you're there, you're there and you have uh, compiled and built your dpiper, you want to either submit a non-interactive bash script or job script through the bsub command, which is the LSF version of qsub, which was the Cobalt one, or sbatch, which is the Slurm one. And here's uh, common flags that you need. Here's for an interactive job, in fact, which would then put you on a, in my case, Z shell onto a launch node, which has a name, something like batch five, batch four. Once you're there, or if your uh, in non-interactive shell script is running there, uh, there's JS run command, which is your launcher command, the counterpart to S run in the first talk on Perlmutter or MPI run on the previous talk. And there's actually quite a different set of flags and you really need to read the summit user guide to understand them but this is a standard one for a deep hyper evaluation um, and you can use this and look at other examples and actually like the js run command in counterpart to an mpi run command because it's extremely verbose and expressive you can actually partition the gpus physical cores on a node and across nodes in a very specific way so you know exactly how to pin your tasks and your you know, Python processes to the GPUs and the cores that you want. So all the fun part on building and running dpiper on, on Summit comes from the Power9 CPU architecture. Because most people, if they're, you know, just using Python or using high-level machine learning libraries like TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, they're going to be used to installing TensorFlow binaries or wheels for PIP or Conda. You even find on Anaconda for like x86 CPUs and a GPU that the releases of these binaries actually lag behind the cutting edge releases of TensorFlow. But it's even worse if you have 
a Power 9 RISC architecture that isn't used that much anymore. And so that's, uh, you'll be looking for this name is the architecture as opposed to, I think it's x86 is how they refer to it in Anaconda package properties. But you'll look for this to see if it's supported on Power 9, but you won't find very many on the official Anaconda channels. Of course, IBM wants people to use their machines and be able to do science on them or AI on them. So they spun off this open source initiative. This is actually the logo here. It's kind of low resolution. Uh, the Open Cognitive Environment, which is supported by a couple institutions and the Open Source Foundation behind the ISA, which uh, IBM open sourced as well because they're kind of getting out of the space but want these machines and these architectures supported going forward. And this is basically a conda channel. And it's going to have pre-compiled binaries of TensorFlow, PyTorch, all the tools you need um, to get an optimized and scalable utilities for Summit. This actually replaced an IBM-specific Conda channel called Watson. Remember Watson, the you know Jeopardy supercomputer that they were trying to market for a long time, and they stopped supporting that and you know moved the heavy lifting to the community, which actually has turned out pretty well because they have very recent packages these days. You don't actually need to download these packages. The OLCF has them already downloaded as read-only environments on Summit. So you can just clone from there as we've seen in the last two talks. Here's the latest release from that channel. If you wanna sample or wanna refer back to this to see if it has the requisite you know, versions of some of these are, this is not exhaustive, but these are the major packages you want. So pretty recent versions of, of TensorFlow and, and PyTorch and Horovod, all that good stuff. So the cloning script is even easier than the other ones because we have this nice base to work off of. And again, I won't repeat it, but we need to uh, build MPI for Pi against the Spectrum MPI that's on the machine. Otherwise you risk getting something that doesn't work or is suboptimal. And so you can just run this on the login node and it should work completely fine. I recommend building this onto a project directory, which is NFS, as opposed to your default home. It just plays better with compute nodes and that way you can be sure when you get onto a compute node that you're able to activate, uh, conda activate this, this custom environment DH that you're building there. And the job submission script, again, is going to be from the sea surface temperature example, which we just translate some of these uh, options up here up top. You're going to obviously change the name of your project. Uh, these options just tell the scheduler to email you when the job starts and finishes. And the other key change to this and the Python scripts, which I won't go through, but of course are in the repository, is that we now have six GPUs per node, so we want to have six MPI ranks. And so here's that JS run command that expresses that we need six resource, set, resource sets per node, as they're called in the, uh, the JS run language. And so you run this simply with bsub job submit after you've built your environment, making sure everything, of course, is in the right place that the, the paths all make sense and it should be automatically loaded and you'd be able to run the SST example at scale on Summit and you're able to pull a bunch of nodes quite quickly. The, the queue's not too deep if there's no reservation on the machine these days. So I think I'd conclude with uh, just a few pro tips as I told you I suffered the last month because there's a lot of little quirks with the system apart from just translating the various scheduler and, and launcher options. First is that I recommended that you build with off of the Python 3.8 OpenCE environment and avoid the more bleeding edge 3.9 because MPI for Pi doesn't build correctly with there with Spectrum MPI. Um, I currently have an open ticket with the help desk there to hopefully figure that out because of course DPiper supports both major distributions of Python. Um, secondly, as I mentioned, you want to build that cloned Anaconda environment in your project directory. But also another good point to highlight is it's really easy to share that environment with other people on the project if the, if the permissions are set correctly. Um, and that's, that's always good to have. Another kind of help desk uh, problem we found recently is that um, there could be issues activating a user cloned Conda environment with JS run. It'll always revert back to the base one, which of course doesn't have DPiper because you know, hopefully someday DPiper will make it into these Anaconda channels open on OpenCE, but they're not there yet. 
Um, and so if you have a problem where it's always reverting back to the base environment, I'd recommend checking your bash env and bash RC settings, because if you source the et cetera profile uh, system-wide config files, it can cause that to happen. It's, we don't know why. And as I mentioned before, the CPUs are incredibly different, not only just from a software support side, but from a performance side. And so it's really advisable to you know, benchmark your codes if you've only been running on x86 plus you know, GPU environments, and this is your first time running on a Power9 system, because you might be surprised where the CPU might now potentially bottleneck your GPUs. Um, so that, you know, it might even, and it's, if you haven't seen the, the data loading on a Power9 system before, it might be vastly different than your expectations. So the repo also, I have a, a note about the Jupyter Hub installation there, um, following from Sam's example for the Jupyter Hub at ALCF. And one unfortunate thing about the Jupyter Hub that's available at OLCF is that this, this environment that we built back here is completely unusable from the Jupyter Hub. It's uh, kind of disconnected from the Summit compute nodes. It kind of runs its own environment. So if you want to use their Jupyter Hub to do deep hyper analytics or do something more interactive, you're gonna to have to re repeat the step from within their Jupyter Hub. And you can you know, use this environment, hopefully you, you'll name it differently, to run your experiments, you know, get the results. And then if you wanna step through them on a smaller scale, you'll have to load the different environment built in nearly the same way. Uh, and you can still access the files, the output CSVs, because all the, it shares the file system. But just to be clear, it has to be a different Anaconda distribution. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you, Kyle. This is great. And, and thanks again for all your work on, on, on Summit. I, I, I know it's, it's not an easy thing to work with IBM sort of, you know, outdated software stack, but um, uh, Kyle had made a lot of progress on that front and we are sort of looking into um, the frontier and also you know there are questions about um, you know how we are you know how this will be supported on non nvidia um, platforms in fact you know aurora machine the net, the exascale machine at argon uh, will be an intel based machine and we are working with intel um, you know trying to um, port uh, deep hyper and get get uh, the the support um, so one thing to note is Deep Hyper sits on top of um, a learning framework. So as long as the TensorFlow and um, as long as the TensorFlow or PyTorch, you know, it's it's sort of available for this particular target platform, then we can sort of use that um, within Deep Hyper. Of course, you know, Deep Hyper has a, a certain dependencies like MPI for Pi and Python. So those those dependencies those dependencies are are, are critical. If a, if a target platform doesn't support Python, we cannot do much. Uh, so that's a, that's a problem. Or it doesn't support MPI for Pi, then we cannot do much. Of course, you know we can try to reinstall from source and try to build this, and that's exactly what uh, um, Kyle was doing. Uh, but essentially, uh, this 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 boils down to the fact that you know if a platform has if if a particular uh, target platform has a, has a PyTorch or TensorFlow. Then you know it's you know, that's that's the sort of thing that we need um, that Deep Hyper needs to do uh, hyperparameter search and neural architecture search and so on and so forth. Uh, there so are some also, fine print things. Yeah, go ahead, Kyle, please. I was going to say um, so I built the Anaconda environment with Deep Hyper on Theta GPU that it'll work for most people you know unless you need the bleeding edge Deep Hyper. So I recommend using that um, mm -hmm. and Polaris. You know, I, no one here has access to none of the attendees have access to Polaris yet but it'll be open for allocation soon. And we hope to have a similar setup there. And it, it, the magic's in the, the Cray MPI and MPI for Pi to you know, really have Deep Hyper humming at large scales. And that'll be exciting to benchmark it there. And I'll be on Frontier next month. So hopefully be able to test out Deep Hyper and see how it does. Yes, um, that's, that's fantastic. Um, again, um, thanks, uh, Kyle, Sam, and, um, and Nasser. Uh, this is a great, um, great session. Um, so we will take a 10 minutes break. We have a little bit ahead of schedule, which is good. Um, so we'll take um, a break um, for 10 minutes and then we will start uh, at 2.10 sharp. Um, there are two more uh, sessions. 
And these two are really like sort of, you know, bleeding edge uh, uh, topics uh, that, that we are very excited to share. Um, so thanks for hanging in so far. Um, it turns out to be a very, um, uh, very good turnout. And uh, we hope uh, to see you um, after the break and uh, come and listen to um, multi-objective hyperparameter search and, um, and uh, metallic pi, which is um, an approach that is sort of making deep hyper more agnostic to any sort of frameworks. You know, we can use, you know, going forward, we can use JAX or FLAX or, you know, whatever type of thing. So it's a sort of an approach to manipulate uh, programs and 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 uh, and search over uh, different implementations of uh, of programs or deep neural network models. So those are really fascinating um, topics, and I hope to see you uh, back in 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 ten minutes. Thank you.